Hello, folks, and welcome to today's presentation, Business Continuity for Tribal Entities. Our presenters today are Arctic IT's President Dave Bailey and CIO Philip Jackson. Also joining us on the call today is special guest Drew McElrath, Strategic Project Manager for Milax Corporate Ventures, a management company for the Milax Band of Ojibwe, located in East Central Minnesota. The purpose of this presentation is to give leaders in both tribal government and tribal enterprise the tools to achieve better business continuity with cloud technology. Dave? Okay, thanks very much. So we'll uh, we'll jump right in. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have a unique guest, one of our clients, as, as Brooke mentioned, so we're pretty excited to have them on the call with us. Business continuity uh, is kind of taken on a whole new uh, definition in and of itself. So before we jump into our deck, you know, situational awareness is what it is for everybody. I think prior to COVID-19, it was important to understand business continuity from, we had, uh, if you were up from Drew's neck of the woods, we had a massive blizzard that shut our offices down for a week. If you were out here in New York on the coast, maybe we had a big hurricane that swamped us for a week, uh, earthquake up in Alaska, you name it. Most of our business continuity plans were built around something happened at our main office location. We have to continue operations. How do we keep going? What most of us weren't prepared for was nothing's wrong with the office. We're just not allowed to go there but we still have to continue operations and function as a team and a business. And how does that change for us? So this is business continuity with a little bit different of a twist on how uh, the cloud um, can, can help foster some of that and just kind of give you some understanding of what some of those opportunities might be that you might not be taking advantage of. Uh, so we'll jump right in. <laughs> So we'll talk about what does a cloud strategy look like for tribal entities. Uh, tribal entities in many cases are similar to um, a government. Um, they have a tribal government. They have a community center and a, and a campus in many cases uh, where they have community services and facilities that they have to operate. And they have for-profit operations that also have to maintain operations, things like that. Um, many of us are familiar with uh, the, the casino side, the hospitality side of tribal operations. But as of the past several years, many of the tribal organizations we work with have diversified their operations into, into additional uh, for-profit entities, what we'll call NGOs or non-gaming organizations. And with that kind of disparate infrastructure and that kind of spread, if you will, of enterprise, uh, it's really important to understand what continuity means. So collaboration, security, and a modern workplace, in, a diff in addition to continuity, also have a big bearing on, hey, what is that cloud infrastructure or that hybrid cloud infrastructure look like? So we're going to tell you a little bit about what some of those different opportunities are today. So legacy technology, if you weren't sure if it was holding you back prior to the situation we're all in right now, you're, you're pretty sure you know exactly what legacy, legacy technology you don't want to keep going with into the future. Um, so how those things get prioritized over you know, safety, uh, health, technology, business, a lot of those things are turned upside down. Health became you know, ultimately more important than anything else. And then we're going to figure out how the economy um, changes, how we prioritize things going forward. But when we look at just legacy applications, siloed teams, people that work um, in specific types of data, um, duplicate data entry, manual processes, <coughs> keying stuff into a spreadsheet, not being able to track information in one place, uh, maybe about a tribal member or a customer of ours or a business relationship and having multiple data sources, and then security issues and keeping all that information together. One, one classic example we see when we work with a lot of tribal organizations is they have program areas spread across their, their enterprise and there will be a tribal member master record in five, six, many times 10 or more databases for the same exact person with the same exact you know, premise of this is my contact record. 
but the address and phone number is going to be different in all of those systems depending on how frequently the tribe interacts with that individual. And that creates more security risk because it broadens the attack surface because people's data is in more than one place at a time. When we get into the for-profit side of things, you heard me mention non-gaming organizations. And as you diversify operations, you know, maybe outside of gaming or have uh, C stores or uh, many of the campuses we work with have developed uh, non-gaming attractions such as concert venues, restaurants, shopping malls, um, other geographically favorable type things like um, properties on a lake, golf courses, you name it. When you have a large area geographically that that spans, it's very difficult to manage all of that. So we started working with Mille Lacs Corporate Ventures a number of years ago. And when they put together their corporate ventures entity, it serves a purpose from not only a shared purpose, uh, shared services perspective, but to also provide IT infrastructure and security. So we have Drew McElrath uh, on with us today because Drew was very instrumental in not only putting forth the vision of, of what they really wanted to achieve with a managed services offering, but also the need for cloud services because they didn't have a traditional brick and mortar uh, office space to help track and, and manage and administer all of these other entities. So a little bit about Mille Lacs Corporate Ventures. Many of you might be familiar with the Grand Casinos. Um, and their enterprise up there, but they also have hotels and several other non-gaming organization enterprises that are inside their portfolio of business. So, Drew, I'd like you to introduce yourself and then we'll have a little dialogue about some of these driving factors that help bring you uh, into the cloud. Thanks, Dave. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep, loud and clear. So I'm Andrew McGrath, most people know me as Drew, uh, Strategic Project Manager for Mille Lacs Corporate Ventures. I work within the office of the CIO, and uh, we're always taking a look at how we can move our digital workplace forward, and that's kind of the portfolio bucket that these activities have fallen under. All right, very good. So I remember, you know, in for some of our first dialogue, you know, you, of course, your, your for-profit enterprises were spawned out of the casino industry. And of course, there's regulation and compliance, gaming commission that, that you have to make sure you adhere to. But as you diversified, it was really clear that some of these non-gaming organizations really didn't necessarily fit the compliance umbrella for the casino type operations. So it became a little bit of a challenge to, to, to manage their IT infrastructure, similar networks, but not similar businesses and needs. So tell us a little bit about that evolution. Sure, so <clears throat> as we started to become more of a management company at our corporate level, uh, as we diversified and bought the hotels in the cities and uh, reorganized our local uh, enterprises, such as our C stores and, and grocery stores and other amenities within the local regional area into a a sub company, uh, we started to realize that in order to effectively collaborate with, with ourselves, our NGO companies, um, and with other vendors and partners that were providing support for those services, that it, it was a challenge over and over uh, to have our infrastructure as a management team within the casino's footprint. Um, and I, you know, that's how we all kind of grew up, right? Um, they, they had the most IT resources, uh, there were some economies of scale for being there, but it really didn't fit our business model of trying to be, uh, you know, a real management company moving forward. So we set forth a vision of, you know, how can we, you know, leap to the cutting edge and uh, be able to collaborate using some of the best tools that are out there uh, rather than some of the oldest tools, which is what we had at the time. And uh, we went forward with the plan to move to Microsoft 365 and selected you guys as a partner. Yeah, and I, um, it's funny that, you, you know, when you go through the evolution of, of um, you know, the, the gaming industry in and of itself from a network perspective, really what it represents, and we'll talk about this in a second, is, you know, it started the casino offered private cloud services, essentially, uh, for other operations inside the tribe. And um, it's weird, you know, over the past 15 to 20 years, it's really interesting to see how, you know, the casino and the tribal government in many cases are still uh, very quite separate. But now from an enterprise perspective, 
technology has been that catalyst um, to help kind of bring the management infrastructure and economies of scale, specifically around security, back into more of a top-down shared services type model. And one of the things that you were able to take advantage of because of the cloud um, was also putting into a, a cloud uh, voice uh, program. So tell us a little bit about one of the values of, of having voice in the cloud as well. For sure. So uh, we wanted to allow our management team to kind of work where they want, how they want, and provide layers of security that didn't interfere with that. So one of the first things we recognized when we wanted to move to M365 is that we did want to take advantage of the team's collaboration and uh, provide that uh, full service tool for collaboration. And then we also wanted to go ahead and port over all of our local phone numbers to teams so that we could have our office essentially even in our hands when you're talking about the team's mobile app. And yeah. so that obeys your presence. You can be you know, not at work so you don't get your work calls just by setting your, your team status uh, like you would set a Skype status. And that's been really powerful for our team to, uh, you know, even now in this current circumstance, I'll use my Skype number or my team's number to to make calls, you know, and to continue to do business. And, you know, people will be surprised because I think I'm calling from the office and that's not the case, right? We've just moved to cloud-based voice. And that's a great example of uh, continuity of operations, you know, without a technology interruption. Nothing, nothing that we have in this PowerPoint replaces the fact that you know, casinos aren't open and customers aren't at stores, but daily day-to-day -day operations, regardless of the type of business, it's uh, very, very impactful, not just for situation that we're in, but from a constant operational integrity point of view, the biggest thing is security. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talked about, you know, prior to, to the event, Drew, was you know, think about the evolution of security in the past 18 months to two years, just inside your own um, deployment of Microsoft 365, the new tools and, and what it's done to your security posture as you look over those 18 months, just by having this subscription in place in the economy of the cloud. So maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, we really consider security the job that never ends. Right, and uh, the set of tools that your team had uh, presented to us as a partner was was a great start. Right, um, hardening devices, encrypting the drives so that if we ever had a compromised device, uh, we wouldn't be concerned about the data that's stored on it. Uh, the Microsoft Office Suite itself, now that we have all of our data for our management uh, functions in the cloud, offers you know a, a really robust security panel. For example. Um, I can tell within our data that's in the cloud just by going to one of the pages on the M365 admin council, you know, what our exposure is in terms of uh, PII data and PCI data and, uh, you know, bank routing numbers, all those breachable data elements that we're concerned about, I can have a end-to-end -end view of what our exposure is. And that's just built right into M365, running those sort of tools to to, to understand what that exposure is like inside our gaming environment right now uh, would would be expensive and uh, you know take a lot of time and configuration uh, to make work. Uh, but with M365, it's just there. Well, very good. So we're um, we're gonna we're gonna go a little further into the deck now. Thank you very much, Drew. And uh, Drew will be available for some questions towards the end of the the session we have today, uh, which I'm sure there'll be a few for sure. You know, one of the one of the one of the great things about you know migrating business operations, or at least a portion of them, to the cloud is when the cloud first came around. A lot of folks, especially in the IT space. Um, they, they may not have had uh, a good understanding of what the cloud meant. And immediately as an IT professional, many of us in that space were like, well, if it's gonna be done as a service, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be needed anymore. Uh, or, or the organization really just isn't gonna need me to do this, you know, my job anymore, because I'm just gonna outsource it to the cloud. And, the underlying story of what you just heard Drew explain is they had to scale out their operation because it grew. They needed the cloud to make that happen due to the variables inside that, that compliance environment and the different types of businesses that were coming into that enterprise. And 
it didn't replace IT people. It changed the focus of those IT resources to be more focused on strategy, uh, utilization, growth, and adoption of tech and how it would affect the business versus the security aspects of being able to inherit the economy of scale that the cloud provided. And that's really an evolution of the IT professional and not just the business. And that's something we'll touch on a little bit as well. So you see here we have public cloud, which is when we talk about Microsoft 365, that's a cloud service, like your electric company provides you electricity, your cable company provides you cable, things like that, you know, as a service. So there's public cloud. There's private cloud, and Drew gave an example of that, where the casino had the largest infrastructure, the most resources, the economy of scale there, and was able to offer cloud-based resources internally to its own enterprise. And then you get into um, hybrid and multi-cloud. Hybrid cloud means I have some of my assets on-premise, some of my assets in the cloud. I may use multiple software as a service vendors or infrastructure or platform as a service. We'll talk about that next. And then multi-cloud is something that their organization also uses as well, where I have a bunch of data, emails, documents, that type of stuff inside the Microsoft cloud environment. But from a tribal perspective, I wanna make sure that I have backups to that information. Don't wanna have all my eggs in one basket. So for that organization, they, they use something called a Barracuda cloud to cloud backup. And believe it or not, that's a multi-cloud strategy because I'm taking Microsoft cloud information, I'm wrapping it up with encryption, and I'm placing that in an AWS data store that actually is uh, a carve out for Barracuda. So there's an example of a multi-cloud strategy where I'm getting the service out of one and I'm getting the backup redundancy and fault tolerance out of another. So there's, there's another aspect of backing up resources in the cloud and believe it or not, there's more than one type of cloud. So we want to make sure that you, you understand that. So easy and expensive setup, scales to your needs, low maintenance, fault tolerance, and geo redundancy. When we talk about continuity, being able to spin up new resources, being able to set up a new office, being able to onboard a new employee, easy and inexpensive setup is really key. That's also an example of scaling to your needs. As business changes and evolves, you have to be able to scale. And without adding more bricks to a brick and mortar solution or more hardware, how do I just increase my operating expense versus my capital expense? One of the biggest things about expense is maintenance. If I have business applications or infrastructure as a service that I'm putting in a public cloud, I'm getting the economy of scale so that my cost of maintenance is low or almost not even there versus having to maintain all that stuff on premise. And then if I have one location and I may actually have you know, several backup uh, environments local to there, geo redundancy is something that's baked into the cloud and gives you multiple options. Well, why is that important? Well, we have catastrophic type issues. We have situations like we're all in right now, but then there's also a little bit more simple thing that could happen as part of a cloud service. This might shock everybody, but um, the cloud is on the ground. I had to explain that to uh, my father. Um, Dad, the, the cloud is on the ground. Why do they call it the cloud, right? So that was a long conversation, half hour of my life, I can't get back. Uh, but the, uh, the, the reality is, is that even cloud infrastructure has outages. There is a 99.95.9% uptime but there may be a case where you're using a business application and the authentication service regionally might go down. Believe it or not, the way that these systems are generated and built is that there are multiple cloud facilities, data centers that also can be fault tolerant, geo redundant of that service. So I might be authenticating on the East Coast into my software as a service all day long. And then by the time four o'clock hits, there's something wrong with the authentication service. It might co-locate over to the Midwest so that I'm still accessing my software as a service. I might get a blip or an interruption. But the value of geo redundancy means I have no single point of failure, regardless of what that business continuity issue might arise. It's not always going to be something like an act of God. It could just be a system failure. These things still run on, on computers. Just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean there's no moving parts. Right, so software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. 
Um, just like everything else in the IT space, we have to create as many acronyms as possible to make sure that everybody else that's not in the IT space thinks that we have some special language that we communicate in. So SaaS, Software as a Service, PaaS, Platform as a Service, and IaaS. All right. So um, most of you would be familiar with some of these acronyms. If you're not, example of business application as a service or a SaaS application is going to be that Office 365. I got my Exchange hosted, so my email server is all being hosted in the cloud. I have uh, my business applications, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneDrive for business, Teams. Those are all examples of software as a service. From an accounting perspective and from an IT budget perspective, keep in mind too that I'm paying for that as a service. I pay a monthly fee, I pay by the year, however I end up having my license agreement. I don't necessarily own software, there's no capital expense. It becomes an operating expense. So whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit, that might vary its value as far as how you spend your money and budget. But that means I have a constant expense that doesn't vary. And most people will say, well, man, I'm paying forever. But if you think about previous ways to license software, which used to be called perpetual licensing, you, know, you, you, would, have, you would have spent three, $400 on office professional every couple of years. And then you would have had to upgrade and update and reinstall and support multiple versions throughout your infrastructure if you weren't doing it all at one time, right? Software as a service flattens the curve um, pun not intended, uh, for, for, for the expense that you constantly go through with infrastructure. I have a subscription, it's constantly up to date and patched and secure, and I have a dependable cost as I look through my budget life cycles over the years. That is a very different way of looking at business. This touches a little bit graphically. Um, you can't get through an Arctic IT presentation without a little uh, Arctic IT iceberg. Right? So a little iceberg action for you. Uh, I think the ratio is actually like 89% uh, underneath, 11% above. So this is close um, for the marketing folks. Uh, but you'll see here that on-premise technology has a tremendous amount of additional ongoing costs. And we'll, we'll argue once in a while with folks on Okay, well, you know, the, the cloud has an expense per user per month and you pay that forever. And they're like, man, years three, four, and five, that gets so much more expensive. If, if I just bought the hardware and the licensing and put that inside my own infrastructure, years three, four, and five, I might not even have that expense. But what they're forgetting is all of the other stuff that's inside those bullets. How do you commoditize and aggregate all that cost of the data center, the people, um, the man hours, and all the stuff on the break fix and the attention that that stuff requires, that that one low monthly fee per user ends up replacing for you. So that pencil exercise, or what we call that return on investment, that, that, that conversation's evolved as we've gone through the years. And it's important to understand that there are certain circumstances where um, on-premise infrastructure and applications do make sense. And most of that's going to be industry specific, right? So when you have hospitals or a manufacturing facility, you'll hear the term edge computing, the edge of the cloud, where in hospitals right now, for example, they're pretty busy, as you might imagine. They can't deal with an internet outage, right? That would be catastrophic. So they have local file storage and local applications that run on edge devices, and they're syncing up locally so that they have a local data store but then that local data store is also being replicated to the cloud and bounced down to other facilities that are in the satellite office locations so that everybody's on one version of the truth, but without internet access, they can still operate and still provide a standard of care. That's a consideration for hybrid cloud with edge computing built in. Manufacturers have the same thing. I have to keep making parts, pieces, things like that from a manufacturing perspective. If I lose internet, I can't just shut down the manufacturing floor. I have to keep operations. So I'm going to use localized storage with edge computing devices that sync up to the cloud, get their licensing and their patching and their security from the cloud. But from an operation perspective, no internet. I'm still operating. Internet glitch too much being used because all the kids are home playing Xbox right now and Fortnite and like crazy, right? Um, you, you have to be able to be prepared for that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about 
some of the capabilities and, and kind of the pathway um, to start looking at that business continuity um, and, and how, you, how you get into that, that, that method of thinking. Many times when you're like, I have to move to the cloud or I have to take this legacy application, it can seem daunting. It's not always as straightforward as we, we would like to maybe have you believe, right? It could have roots and integrations into other things. Uh, there, there's many different aspects that have to go into it. So we, we use this, this nine step process to look at not only how we look at new opportunity as a partner that helps bring people in, but for someone like Drew and the last corporate ventures, it was like, okay, well, what infrastructure and resources do you need access that's inside that current cloud environment, that private cloud that you're using from the casino? And what do you need to operate? So you have the business requirements and then you have the tactical asset requirements. And let's evaluate, okay, what can we move? What do we need to keep? What do we have to start with? Where do we need to end up? And we prioritize how that migration is going to occur so that there's no interruption to business, there's no interruption to the utilization of things like mission critical email, access to documents, accounting systems. So we'll map your on-prem footprint. It's always good to start from a documented starting point because you, if you don't, you have no way to compare what you started with, right? Then we're gonna map dependencies on those assets and then figure out what are the low hanging fruit, what are more complex and what are gonna take a little bit more strategy. And then try to assign workload costs to that. Once we get into a cost model, we prioritize, we evaluate how we wanna move and then we say, okay, Let's take that next step for a migration strategy, prepare that environment and get it provisioned, test migrate what that content's going to look like up there, let the end users that are gonna to have to use it make sure everything works as expected. And once we have consensus there, we do a live migration of that resource application or workload. We come back around and do a QA, QC on the security and integrity of the solution. We back things up, we document it, it gets scheduled into maintenance. Those are the nine steps that we break out a project in. And that's the same thing you would do, whether it was just one application or it was a bank of servers, you still have to go through these nine steps. Okay. So we talked about anywhere, anytime, any device, ability, agility, and flexibility. Never more apparent and valuable than the world we're in right now. But we still come back to work when this all blows over and, you know, this too shall pass, right? We still go back to work and we have a new understanding of some of the challenges we had with IT. We know what worked for us remotely. We know which applications functioned well, which ones didn't. And it's really going to help speed up that prioritization. So what is business continuity and how does that business continuity plan change into the future based upon the situation we're in? We talked about some of the stuff that most people wrap around, email, documents, things like that. We're a very Microsoft focused shop. Um, if you're familiar with us, you know that. If you're not familiar with us, you'll know that now. We, um, we hang our hat on that Microsoft solution stack because of the value, integrity, and security that it's always provided to us and our customers. Uh, every once in a while, we'll bring people out of competitive platforms or we'll integrate applications into AWS or we might have a multi-cloud strategy with AWS and a Microsoft Azure environment. That's very common. Multi-cloud is not something that we don't embrace. But when we talk about business applications specifically and that modern workplace, Microsoft, again, is our, is our, um, is our, key, our key solution there. Um, Microsoft Dynamics 365 is a term that represents all the business applications that Microsoft puts out there. So whether it's an ERP or accounting finance application, a CRM solution, a customer service field service um, application, or one of the things that we specialize in is developing custom applications in a low code or no code environment to help people put software and technology into manual processes where they never really had a good tool, right? So we look at those three areas as Azure, um, an integration platform, and then what we call a collaboration platform. 
when we talk about business applications, for example, if I'm in a tribal government or I'm in a tribal casino, tribal government, I'm working with my, my tribal membership, their families, right? And I'm looking at providing uh, services and different types of community level engagement for them as part of that tribal community. And then if I'm in that tribal enterprise space, I'm working with customers, patrons, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a casino, whether it's some other type of business, that relationship is going to require typically a relationship management software, CRM. So we have case management technology on the tribal government side. We have player development technology on the tribal side. They both start from a common platform called Dynamics 365 and Power Apps. We're able to customize and configure that user interface to represent those vastly different types of businesses and the very different types of data that they need. Centrally though, at a tribal level, having expertise in that Microsoft platform allows not only tribal IT and its own infrastructure team to support and extend, but they're able to develop new technology and new processes inside that business application suite. So it's a very tailored um, platform driven business application space. One of the most impressive pieces about it is that common data service. Earlier, I talked to you about the fact that you have tribal member information in 10 different systems. If you're on the casino side, you know that you have player information in 10 different systems, one for marketing, one for golf, spa, hotel, restaurant. There, um, You might have that loyalty program that's got that player record in there, right? And now you're trying to communicate with both your tribal member and potentially your, 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 business, your business customer on a mobile device. All of that business application software can be done in one suite, hosted in one cloud environment from a subscription perspective with the same security tools that you use internally for yourself to secure your community and potentially your customers, depending on how you're deployed. You heard me talk about all the different applications that would be inside this environment. That Dynamics 365, this graphic shows you all of the different pieces that are inside that family of products. So you don't have to have separate vendors and separate pieces of software for all the different things you wanna add in to that enterprise stack for your solution. You can have one common platform with a similar security and approach fully integrated to everybody's desktop to provide what's called that modern workplace. So when I want to write a document to a customer or a tribal member, I have that baked right into the same technology I'm using everywhere else. And that sounds like, um, you know, maybe I drank a little Microsoft uh, Kool-Aid, right? And uh, it is the business application utopia that I define. But the other component is, is that you may have, and you do have many line of business applications that aren't inside that Microsoft stack. What you're also able to do in this platform is take those investments, preserve them, put additional layers of security by integrating them into a centralized business application and data source, and still get additional investment and value out of those separate applications and not have to spend more money on third-party tools to integrate them. You have one central location, and you can create relationships of that common data service through what's called Power Automate, which is an integration tool. You can also use Azure SQL data services to pull data from those systems, put it in one place, create a data warehouse, or the buzz term you might hear lately is something called a data lake. Having that common data model is one of the biggest requests we get from every tribal entity we ever do business with. For-profit, tribal government, doesn't matter. It's the data that they struggle with and how to maintain it, how to secure it, and make it valuable to everybody that needs it. Dynamics, from an ROI perspective, um, there's lots of different studies. It's pretty hard nowadays uh, for a return on investment from a cloud perspective on what people actually get out of it. But one of the ways we are able to establish it is to say, you had these six or seven applications that we consolidated into one. That's how we can tell you how you've saved money, you've saved effort, you've made yourself more secure, you've lowered your risk, and you have less management involved. So it is more quantifiable than it used to be uh, in the future because of the applications we can replace. Teams is one of the, the, 
the most widely used Microsoft technologies on the planet today. Um, this situation that we're in right now has vastly uh, accelerated what Teams has done in the marketplace. Um, if you're not familiar with Teams, uh, we're using, for example, uh, GoToMeeting. We're using a webinar, we have um, content to display, we have video to chat, but I'm talking to you, you're listening to me. I don't have to collaborate on content. So Teams is not only a communication tool, you heard Drew talk about, I'm gonna use it for my phone system, I'm gonna use it for video, I'm gonna use it for chat and collaboration, but it also replaces in some components, in many components in my opinion, the artist formerly known as SharePoint. So being able to collaborate on content with uniquely defined teams for that content, it is also that enterprise content management solution. So now we have communication, collaboration, and content management all in one system. To me, that's been the missing component for many of our clients over the past several years, and just being able to tie that stuff together. You look at how hard it was for companies to adopt SharePoint because you told somebody that for 30 years has been playing yellow folder file hockey on their desktop and just creating and stuff and stuff in it. Hey, by the way, Monday morning, that's all gone from you. You have to put it in a website and do three different steps to get it there. There's nobody that was like, oh man, I'm so excited for Monday morning. They weren't. There was no way to make that happen until Microsoft came up with chat, communication, content administration, and collaboration in one user interface, in one pane of glass. That advantage in and of itself makes a go-to meeting or uh, a Zoom or whatever other meeting technology you want to talk about strictly just a meeting technology. And they have their place. They have some of their advantages. For example, Zoom, you can have, I think it's up to 48 uh, different cameras all showing at the same time. You gotta have some pretty sick bandwidth for that, by the way. I don't know anybody that's got 48 rocking unless they're on fiber. That's a lot of video coming through at one time. Microsoft is feverishly working on the ability to allow you to configure how many incoming video squares you'd like to have. Um, if any of you are old enough to remember Hollywood Squares, I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, but uh, uh, it is something that they're working on just to make sure you're not like, well, Zoom gives me more cameras. It's like, yeah, they're, it's, it doesn't allow you to collaborate on content, though. And it arguably has some security features you might want to question as well, competitively. Again, I drank a lot of Kool-Aid. So. so if you haven't figured out, Teams has a really good chat engine, um, screen sharing to actually work collaboratively with somebody to share documents. So let you do check-in, check-out version control. But Arctic IT, for example, we have employees all over the United States. We're able to work on the same documents and collaborate like we're sitting together. And if you have two monitors hooked up, you have FaceTime with those individuals. You have the ability to have a virtual uh, connection with them face to face. And it's tremendously valuable. And on top of that, from a security perspective, we're governing the content. We're protecting it. We're encrypting it. It's integrated into our calendars, and we have one unique place to work. And that brings me to security. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson uh, is our CIO at Arctic IT. He's responsible for keeping us and our customers uh, plugged into the services that we provide and the security that we, we rely upon. So Phil, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, Drew talked about this early on. A modern workforce requ requires modern security. We can't do things the way we used to do. And so before we would build these, you know, castles or forts, and we'd put a giant firewall in, and we'd put a moat around it, and then and make it really secure on the outside. Uh, and then once you got on the inside, it was ooey gooey. But uh, now people work from anywhere, just like Drew was talking about, uh, and, and, and we want them to be able to do that. That requires a different kind of security than what we used to have. Um, work from home, work remote, it means operating in kind of a zero trust environment. Microsoft's just built some really great tools uh, to help us with the security. Um, so let's talk a second about Microsoft 365. Um, this is Microsoft's offering uh, now uh, that includes their kind of entire suite of, of things. So you have Microsoft uh, 365 apps for business. 
Um, and this was formally called Office 365. So Microsoft 365 um, includes what used to be Office 365. And that's the, your desktop apps you're used to and online versions of Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You know, these apps still drive our companies. They're not going anywhere. They're gonna be around for a long time. Other people have tried to switch to some, some different tools and usually end up always coming back to the Microsoft tool set. They're strong. But notice what it says kind of after the hyphen there, always up to date with the latest versions with automatic updates. So with Microsoft 365, you get automatic updates, just like many of us do with our phones. You know, you just wake up in the morning and it says we, you've got a new update. That happens with um, Microsoft 365 now, and you, you get those updates automatically. From So from a security standpoint, it's one of the most important things you can do is get those updates. We used to just buy software and run it for 10 years. That doesn't work anymore in, in the secure environment. Also with my, Microsoft 365, you can get Windows 10. So Windows 10 is certainly the most secure operating system that Microsoft has ever done. Uh, that was built uh, with security in mind, security ground up. Um, and again, you see it's always on the latest version with automatic updates. And then finally, um, Microsoft 365 has a whole lot more around mobility and security. Um, and we're gonna kind of dive into that on the next slide, but you get security that, that you could not, most organizations couldn't afford uh, the, the level of uh, professionals that Microsoft has working on the security. So what do you get with the Microsoft 365 threat protection? You know, we talk about different security and now we have to have layered security. So each one of these uh, icons represent different layers of security in your organization. First, you've got Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. That is way more than antivirus. It is looking at connections and looking at things that might be uh, trying to do such stuff on your computer and, and terminating processes terminating connections all in the background. Um, it's, it's happening. And all of that is AI driven. So Microsoft feeds information in from everybody. So it's an AI driven kind of threat detection. And then Exchange Online advanced threat protection, way more than just anti-spam kind of things. It's constantly monitoring your inbox. If there's a threat that came in overnight and it got delivered and then through AI, they realize, oh, this is a phishing email or whatever. It will actually go back in and pull that out of your email box or, or change the links. You get uh, link protection. All of that is built into the Exchange Online advanced threat protection. Um, and then you got Microsoft Cloud App Security. Uh, again, Drew talked about being able to log on that dashboard and see, you know, what all he's got um, and where what exposure he might have. Um, you get so so much with that dashboard, as well as multi-factor uh, authentication. If you're not familiar with that, that's usually when you use your phone and your password to be able to log in. So it's something you know, like your password, and something you have, like your phone it will thwart like 99.9% .9 of all attacks. So if you're not doing multi-factor authentication, you ought to be. Um, and then finally, Azure Advanced Threat Protection. So Dave talked about some of that uh, platform as a service or, or infrastructure as a service. Maybe you've got some uh, Azure servers out there. Um, you get all of this security and all the dashboards built in into the Azure Advanced. So it's all about layered security and, and modern stats. Thank you very much, Phil. Appreciate it. And uh, you know, there are different flavors, just like any other Microsoft subscription. There are different flavors of, of Microsoft 365, depending on what your business model is, the size of your business, um, you know, how it evolves. In, in good fashion, they allow you to start with a suite of products that's right size for your business. So if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 desktops, um, there's um, a version of Microsoft 365 for business. If you graduate up to 300 desktops, um, you can go to Microsoft 365 Business Premium. And then there's enterprise editions as well that afford you some additional uh, features and, 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 and different opportunities. For the security pieces, which I commend them on, it, it, allows, it also allows you to add some of these security things regardless of the size because you might have a compliance issue 
where you don't have a lot of desktops and you don't have a lot of users, but your compliance issues are higher or more complex because of the type of business you're in, you can add some of these security tools uh, as an add-on uh, into your subscription world. Um, and and it, like anything, one of the key aspects of Phil's slide in here too is that it talks about security in layers. So you have the desktop layer, you have the email, which is your communications, you have multiple applications, whether it's bring your own device, you're using mobile devices, tablets out there in, in your business. And then you might have cloud resources where you just moved it from the infrastructure on premise into some Azure infrastructure, infrastructure as a service platform, right? Um, and you still need to secure those things because you have people that need to get in there. And it's really no different than infrastructure that you have on premise. You need security tools on the servers themselves, things like remote desktop and things like that still have to be configured. So the IT professional, as you heard Drew say earlier, as well as Phil is to say, okay, well, just because I'm moving stuff from on-premise into the cloud, doesn't mean I don't have to do anything anymore. It just changes the way that you work on those things, monitor and administer them, and it shrinks down the expense at a capital level so that you can focus dollars and energies on other things that are more strategic. So the modern workplace in and of itself is, is, is a term that Microsoft markets, I believe, very well, um, uh, but it also, it also has to be taken into consideration of the modern workplace is not the same for everybody. Um, we've done work, for example, with uh, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, where they actually have to go out and meet in different communities and bring the technology with them. In many cases, there's no internet connectivity. It's not even mobile phone. There's not even any cellular data connectivity. So they have the ability to work on a tablet that stores the data encrypted local on that device. And when they connect back up, they can put in the case information, the notes that they took, any of the information that they work with inside the Dynamics 365 application. And that's an example of modern workplace is not the same for everybody. But if you're using the same foundational tool set and you're using the same security, those are the two components of a modern workplace that you can put in place with a subscription and then edit it as you need it to work for your business. Collaboration, sharing, chat, meet, work together. We talked about Teams and the power of Office 365 or the artist formerly known as Office 365 in case you caught that point from Phil. It's now called Microsoft 365, right? You have power applications or power apps that can be built inside that dynamics world. And then you have reporting technology as you aggregate data across that common platform. All of that we consider to be what's called a modern workplace saving time, money, and resources with security at scale. That's really the premise of how business continuity has evolved. And if you haven't had that deep cloud conversation in the past, I'm sure it's going to evolve pretty quickly over the next several months. We talked about a methodology to help get you there, right? This nine step plan, it's different for everybody. It might just be for one business application. It might be for a large chunk of infrastructure. The steps don't change. If you need help doing that, or you've never gone through that exercise before, we're finding that a lot of our clients feel this is a little bit daunting, and maybe their IT is so focused on the day-to-day -day that they really haven't got to this strategy level. One of the things we're offering as part of our, our efforts um, is, to, is to help get you that done is, is a two-hour uh, uh, session, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, when we talk to you about tribal enterprise, tribal government, um, not only is it, a, is it a vertical market that we put a lot of pride and effort into over the past uh, 18 years, but it is also um, important for you to know that we are also a tribally owned enterprise. We understand a parent-child relationship. We have a parent organization. They're based up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and um, they have a tribal government organization called the Tanana Chiefs Conference regionally. Things are done in Alaska a little differently than the lower 48 with respect to tribes and reservations and that type of thing. So we have the for-profit and the non-profit understanding. Uh, and we work in that space. So when we talk to you about the different ways that we've done things, I can tell you with good confidence, no tribe ever does anything the same way when it comes to practice and service and community, they're very different culturally, uh, but there is a common thread that we have been able to work with, and that is technology. 
right? So technology brings a lot of those components together and there is some economy of scale. So let technology be that catalyst for you as it has been for us, okay? So as a result of some of the efforts we've put in over the last few months, we're doing a two hour technical conversation um, with, with our key technical resources. It doesn't cost you guys anything. If you wanna go through any of those workloads or considerations to move some of those workloads to the cloud, what did you realize didn't have a good continuity plan as a result of COVID-19? What features, functions, operations have you struggled with as far as resources? that you know a cloud technology is going to help you be more prepared for challenges in the future, right? Let us be part of that conversation. We're offering this to you as a free service. If you're interested, go ahead and hit us at Connect at Arctic IT. There's also a great Microsoft offer out right now. Um, get Teams for six months. This is still in place. And if you hadn't been been able to make good use of teams or weren't even familiar with it you know get in touch with your it folks or if you are on the it team let us help you do this we'll help you get set up on it we'll help you do a little consultation and training on it as well um, and microsoft has a couple other um, offers out there to help people um, get back into uh, the new way of working as uh, we kind of turn the lights back on in the united states so um, if you have questions about that let us know so we'll open it up to uh, questions. I'm not sure, uh, Brooke, if you've gotten any questions from the field. Um, yes. but, uh, Thank you, Dave. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dave and Philip, Andrew. Um, now I'll just I'll just give the attendees a little bit of time to enter their questions. That you use the uh, Q and A box, so it's over there at the control panel on the right hand side, um, and then I'll read those questions aloud. And um, while we wait for you to enter those questions, I just want to mention that we also have a survey at the end of the presentation. We really appreciate your feedback. We use that to determine future topics. So we really appreciate you filling that out. Thank you. Um, and I do see one question so far, Dave. Um, could you share just a little bit more about how we move to the cloud if we have occasional connectivity issues? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's a, it's a common question in Indian country. Um, one of the one of the key issues here is um, if you have connectivity issues where you work, um, it's important to be in a location that has good cloud connectivity to get that foundation set up. Make sure you have a good infrastructure relationship for security and backups into that cloud environment. When you move to um, any of those locations that have sporadic or poor connectivity. If you know in advance that you're gonna be going out to those spots, one of the best things to do is pull down what you need, work in offline mode or an offline capacity on that local device. That device should be encrypted, protected and secured. Do what you can on it. And then when you bring in, when you go back to that better connectivity or that more firmly connected environment, that's when you sync everything back up. So if you have sporadic connectivity using a mobile device, a tablet, a, a laptop, something to that effect, where you can pull what you need to work on locally, work on it, and then sync it back up, that is your best bet. Um, if you're always in a place that has really poor internet connectivity, um, all kidding aside, maybe the cloud's not for you. <laughs> but, but nowadays, most of us have access um, to a place where I have good cloud connectivity, um, sometimes, and at a minimum, when you're in that location is when you want to sync everything up, set it to protected, encrypted, secured. God forbid you lose your mobile phone, your laptop, that stuff is all backed up in the cloud. Any Thank other you. questions, bro? Thank you, Dave. Yes, this one is for Drew. Um, Drew, what was the biggest challenge you overcame in moving your organization to the cloud? Well, I think... Uh, you know, obviously dealing with our regulators and them having some, um, you know, fears about putting data in the cloud uh, from a corporate perspective that may associate with the gaming data that they're in charge of regulating. Uh, one of the ways we overcame that was just by starting the conversation with them with, with what you have in common, which is you both deeply care about protecting your data and your assets. Right. No, you don't want to see your systems compromised. You don't want to see your data compromised. And that's exactly what the regulators uh, are thinking about every single day. So we were able to 
uh, get together information about how that happens in a cloud environment and show them the layers upon layers of security that we use. Um, one of them is not physical. Uh, and physical is what a lot of these teams have leaned on for a long time. You gotta make sure you have your you know, server room access sheet filled out and if you're missing a blank, you know, you get slapped for it, right? Yeah. Um, and they, they're not gonna be able to look at that because Microsoft's not gonna tell them who logs in and out of uh, you know, their server farm in Iowa, right? So we had to help them understand what tools are out there, how they work and how they can have oversight and auditing on you know, those aspects that are keeping our data and systems. That was a big one. Uh, if there was one other that I would say, it's just the culture, right? Um, you think that you're a management company and that your people are focused on, you know, the higher company level strategic thinking. Um, but when you take your management team out of the casino environment, you start to see how many ways in which your management team is supporting casino operations and how many ways in which casino systems are supporting your team. And uh, when we started 14 months ago, um, you know, a lot of people had access back and we were still relying on them for a lot of things. But within 14 months, that's been really, really narrowed down. And so uh, just because you want to separate doesn't mean you're going to be able to pull apart all those uh, pieces immediately. But uh, just getting started really highlighted where those uh, where those pieces were. Yeah, and if I might, Drew, I think, you know, two things you touch on. Um, one is controls, security and controls. You talk about server room access, data center access, and from a regulation perspective, uh, gaming commission and IT authority. Um, please know that, you know, for the audience, in addition to the tribal side of things, these data centers also have um, controls that they have to make sure they have in place. They are subject to audits and those audit records are actually public information. Um, uh, so whether it's a Microsoft cloud, an AWS cloud, or any other third party cloud, public cloud, they must also go through cloud security controls and audits. And so there is that SLA uh, or security. The reality is, and this is tough to have with your regulatory body, and, and, and I know that Drew had some of these conversations as well, there's no such thing as 100% secure. There isn't. Um, there just isn't. Uh, I'm not saying that there won't be someday, uh, but 100% secure is very difficult for anybody to raise their hand and say, yep, 100% secure. That's, that's really hard to say, right? So if, if that's the case, you have to be able to demonstrate evidence and proof of being able to say that these controls are in place. One of the cool things about moving workloads into the cloud is you inherit controls because you've also offloaded liability, you have. You've offloaded liability of breach. You have also mitigated and migrated some of the risk you have. If you have data here in your on-premise data center and there's a breach, you are responsible for that breach. If you have moved your data into a cloud facility, right, and all of your controls are in place and you have evidence of that, and that cloud facility suffers a breach, liability has been mitigated and relocated, right? It doesn't mean you can't get sued for everything in between, but mitigating liability and risk is part of a cloud conversation for business continuity as well. Business continuity also is a very big component of breach. If your local data facilities are breached, but you had redundant and cloud backup in place, the, the, the risk and the contingency is vastly different conversation than if all your eggs were on premise. Ransomware, big deal. Past year, currently right now, for a lot of our tribal clients, um, they can't get their stuff backed up in the cloud soon enough. Um, you also brought up sovereignty to a certain extent. This is my data. I don't want anybody else to have access to it. How do I protect it? There are ways that you can bring your own encryption key to the cloud and lock up your stuff that only the tribe has access to that data. Even if it was subpoena, even if somebody said, Microsoft, I want you to give me that tribe's data, they can get the data, but they're not going to be able to read it. It's encrypted. The only people that have the keys are the tribe itself. So the subpoena would have to go to the tribe. So sovereignty has constantly been part of that conversation for compliance. Um, and, and that has evolved as well. One of the other things too is that, that Drew touched on is, it is an evolution. 
it's not very common that everybody can just rip everything out and move everything to the cloud in one shot. And if you haven't been there yet, uh, you, you want to move a few pieces uh, at a time and, and get, a, get a bearing and get a sense for how that goes and, and grow into that. So maybe it's one business application at a time. Maybe it's a little bit of infrastructure. Everybody's got a different pace depending on the business. Any other questions, Brooke? Yes, yes, Dave. I think you spoke to some of this already, but um, this is a great question. What What would you say to convince tribes that are leery about using the, the cloud due to security concerns? Biggest concern is losing casino data to a competitor. Yeah. So, so really, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a solid conversation. It's going to be different. Um, um for depending on the operational maturity of the governing body whether it's the gaming commission of the tribe the state or the council depending on how the tribe governs its for-profit operations gaming data in and of itself you know if you want to say from a tribal cio perspective that my data center where i keep my casino data is more secure than microsoft's if you want to say that well then i I applaud you. I would say that that you're awesome. Um, but from a risk and mitigation perspective, it's really hard for you to have as much security and control around that data as you can get from an economy of scale perspective in a Microsoft cloud or or an AWS cloud. I'm, this isn't a brand thing. Again, we're a Microsoft shop. That's where we would put anything. Right. That's our knowledge set. That's our skill. But the cloud security of scale and the layers of security that you inherit by putting that up there, breach is possible if you have something like um, privilege escalation because of credentials that have been stolen or something like that, right? Just because you put your stuff in the cloud doesn't eliminate the need for you to have physical and certain elements of control for security. But the overall cloud security itself from a network perspective, fault tolerance, encryption, um, co-location, um, data access, you can't make the same investment in your on-premise infrastructure than someone can at scale inside that public cloud and have the same level of security. And that is a professional, that's a professional level argument for sure. Yeah, you know, I went to a thing, Microsoft employs over 2,000 security professionals now. 2000 people. I mean, that's a huge company in and of itself, just the security side of the Microsoft offering. And like you were yeah. just saying, you can't employ those. That's the best and brightest. If you're the best and brightest in security, you're going to work at Microsoft and you're working on their cloud and they run, you know, red team, blue team exercises. You just can't get that security. Uh, yeah, I've uh, I've had the privilege of visiting their 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 cyber um uh, facilities, their cyber range, if you will, um, in Redmond. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. And the thing is, too, is that like you know, right now, if you had casino operations data, your player data, your competitive information, right? If if that's all laying at rest and it's fully encrypted, and you're you're saying that you're 100% secure, which I don't believe there is such a thing. Um, you know, congratulations, you've built a really great security um, infrastructure. But is it that secure six months from now, six months from now with the same investment? What level of investment do you have to keep making? How quick does the threat landscape evolve? Are you evolving at the same pace and at the same scale? That's where the conversation starts to take different shape. Most people are going to be worried about someone getting their data and using it against them, like the question suggests. If you have it encrypted and you have it stored up there, more importantly, risk and scale is something that you can't manage the same way on premise. So bottom line, it's worth an argument. It's worth a conversation. Uh, but anybody that says their stuff is more secure on premise than it is in a cloud environment, I think has to check themselves. I really do. That's my professional opinion. Any other questions, bro? Um, I don't see any other questions. We had um, some interest in the recording. We will make sure to send that to all of you. Um, we just really want to thank you all for attending today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to Phil and Drew. Really, really uh, great to have you guys uh, on board. Great to have a uh, client participate 
and uh, hopefully you're all uh, staying uh, positive, safe, and healthy. And um, like I said, we'll get back to the, the new normal soon here, and, and hopefully we can engage you in some deeper conversations and help you take better advantage of some cloud resources and set ourselves up for IT success going forward into the, the new normal. So uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, take care.